prices go up in a neighborhood that is fixed, that's one thing. Everybody understands that part. And then they should understand that at that point, another actor might come into the picture. A monster that nobody can see, that nobody really understands, whose language is incomprehensible. And then they can maybe be curious and say, let me check out that monster. Who is this monster actually? What is happening here? I don't believe that capitalism itself is hugely problematic. Is unbridled capitalism in an area that is a human right problematic? Yes. And I think that's what differentiates housing as a commodity from gold as a commodity. Gold is not a human right. Housing is. Lalani Faha at Frederick Gurton, welcome to you both. Thanks. Good to be here. Your film, uh, Push, uh, addresses arguably the, if we just park climate change for a second, the uh, uh, issue of a generation. It's how gentrification uh, and spiralling house prices are pushing uh, generations into both debt and out of cities. Uh, I know it's very glib of me to say, explain the film uh, in just a, a minute or so. You'd say, well, God, I've made the whole thing. Why don't you watch it? But just give us a rundown of the film and, and why you made it. What was the intent behind making Push? The intention was trying to understand what is going on. Why are our homes getting more expensive over and over? And this is something I've seen all over the world. So this is the stress that so many people are living under. And it's not only the poorest people, it's also young doctors, uh, architects, you know, it's like it's, it's something that everybody is suffering, this, this stress. And you mentioned in here gentrification. And one of the things that we very early understood, this is something much, much deeper than gentrification. This is not an area that is being converted when the old people die and then the new, new generation move in. This is a totally different energy. This is the financial circus moving in and taking and making our homes into instruments in, in a totally different game that has nothing to do with, with our homes. Leilani, you are the former UN Special Rapporteur on housing. Now you're the Global Director of The Shift, uh, the global movement to uh, secure the human right to housing. Do you think that it is a, uh, let's say, uh, an indicator of a sick society that a role like yours has to exist when shelter is basic human right? I, I, I don't think it's bad for there to be UN rapporteurs or an organization like The Shift um, trying to hold governments and other actors accountable to human rights. Um, that's part of how democracy works. And, it, and, and, and I think it's, it's healthy um, that there be exchange and, and, and you know, um, a pushing uh, that governments and other actors do better. Um, so in that way, no. Uh, do I think what's happening globally with housing, that, do I think that's a travesty and obviously gross violation of, of the right to housing? Yes. So um, that, there, there are two different issues to me. Um, I think it's important to have accountability measures out there. Uh, but I also think that what's happening with housing, and I think the pandemic really exposes it, is, is hugely problematic. Um, and as Frederick said, not just for poor people, it's for people living in the middle classes. It's for our children who will never be able to afford a home in a city. The problem when, I mean, if you look at Notting Hill today, just to take one piece of land in the world, I mean, look around, it's, it's uh, properties bought by, uh, from shell companies in tax havens, and people don't even live there. It's 80 to 90% of these properties stand empty. That's nothing to do with gentrification. It's a, it's, this is a financial game. It's a, uh, it's laundering of money, it's tax evasion, it's what you can, you can give 10, 20 different labels on this, but it's, it's much deeper than, than gentrification. 
So it's um, what Nick Shaxton would call the finance curse, isn't it? Uh, because people don't know who own these properties. It's not Adam Smith's invisible hand, it's actually uh, the invisible hand of the rent seekers who are sitting in the Cayman Islands. They've got one hand uh, taking the rent out of the flat uh, and the other hand uh, dodging tax uh, on that. So from a community point of view, these, uh, the community created value there gets sucked out and taken offshore. Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly right. And Frederick and I, um, since Push, uh, started a podcast to keep the conversation going called Pushback Talks. And in one of the episodes there, we talk about golden visas, which I think is is such a, um, it's a, a microcosm of this macro financial issue that you just raised, Ross. Golden visas is where you basically have um, a scheme such that foreigners can buy property and get citizenship, basically. And there's a, you know, a, a line at which you have to um, contribute. And we know, and Al Jazeera has covered this as maybe RT has too, um, that this, this just lends itself to the flow of corrupt money into, into cities, into property. But what it doesn't do is contribute in any way to the, to the local community. And that's what Frederick was describing, where you have these absentee landlords um, they're not even landlords. They're just simply financial actors and they're absent and they have no interest in the community. They don't, they, I mean, if they pay property taxes, that's the only thing that's going into the community if they pay property taxes. And not only is it creating a housing problem, it creates, you know, unaffordability and all of that, but it also doesn't lend itself to good community building, um, which is why I think so many cities are starting to say, hey, like, investor-driven housing is not cool in my city, if you take the mayor of Berlin or the mayor of Barcelona out of Calau, for example. I paradisi fiscali sono il luogo dove capitalismo legale e capitalismo illegale si incontrano. Cosa hanno in comune la regina Elisabetta e Rafael Caro Quintero, boss del narcotraffico messicano? Cosa hanno in comune le Shakira e la Apple, tutti hanno una parte o, o la quasi totalità dei loro capitali in paradisi fiscali. Le stesse banche fanno affari con i cartelli e fanno affari con chi fa denaro onestamente. Si mischiano con i soldi della coca, si mischiano con i soldi dell'evasione nello stesso posto. Questi soldi cosa diventano? Diventano aziende, diventano turismo, alberghi, negozi, supermercati, squadre di calcio, um, arte, musei, politica. E non puoi più rintracciarne l'origine. La prima cosa che hanno fatto i grandi gruppi economico-finanziari americani, Amazon, Facebook, Netflix, tutti, e cercare degli spazi dove pagare meno tasse. Ma com'è possibile che in un paese come l'Italia un lavoratore onesto paghi il 60% e un'azienda multimiliardaria paghi il 5 e il 4% di tasse? Leilani, you've been um, close to the political process. Uh, do you think that we have uh, politicians or a political class with the gumption necessary, especially when you have so many lobbyists working on behalf of people like Blackstone uh, and others? Uh, do you think we have a political class with the uh, necessary gumption to be able to stand up and say, actually, enough's enough. We're going to uh, start reversing some of these policies. No, in many, in many cases, absolutely not. And we know that the likes of Blackstone and the CEO Schwartzman himself wield incredible political power. There's no doubt about it. When Donald Trump uh, was um, president, the first thing he did was he struck an economic advisory council. And the, C the chairperson of that council was Schwartzman, the CEO of Blackstone. So, I mean, we know that they are thick as thieves. That's why I tend not to say um, this is about politics. I think it's about the interaction between politics and law. And law sh in the area of housing should be driven by human rights because housing is a human right that governments from around the world have committed to by signing international treaties, excuse me. So um, 
what we need is more politicians to understand what their human rights obligations are, what they've committed to, and to actually act on that. Um, so that takes a lot of courage. There is a certain amount of dismantling of this, the current financial reality and system that would have to occur. Now, I'm not talking about dismantling capitalism, and people often ask me about that, and in the film, I'm really clear about that. Um, I think that what we need to do is make capitalism responsive to human rights. But Frederick and I, because of the film and we keep tracking this issue, we're starting to see some courageous politicians. And what they're doing is they're taking legislative action. We also have the national government of Denmark having adopted very recently what they call um, the Blackstone Lex or the Blackstone Law. And that was fashioned in a way to keep out big private equity. And they did that by saying, okay, if you want to come in and purchase a building and do these cosmetic renovations, fine, but you can't raise the rent for five years. You can't try to recoup your costs for five years. Well, that has put a complete chill on that kind of activity. That's one example of legislative action that would be in keeping with the human right to housing, and it's so important. So there are some courageous politicians out out there, I just, we, th we need to see more. I mean, we are in the midst of the, this pandemic. It's been on for a long time. Have you seen the stock market? You know, it goes like crazy. It, I mean, the people, I mean, the billionaires of, of America has be, became 25% richer during 2020. 25% richer, the billionaires. But the stock market isn't the real economy, is it? No, that's the story. I mean, we, it's, it's two separate realities. So I think, I mean, in the beginning, in the early days, the financial sector was a service sector to people doing stuff, producing stuff. Now they have their own little game that it's not so, the people who produce and do good stuff are, are, are being punished and they make the money. So it's, it's, it's a very sick situation. And I think, you know, 50% of all money on the world stock markets our, finance, our pension fund money. So I think one way is to, to talk to our pension funds and push them into making investments that are good also for human rights. I mean, I mean, I think it was the Church of England who started a long time ago to divest the arms industry. And then they moved on to divest uh, oil and uh, fracking and coal and so on. I think it's a good way to now to move into, let's divest... Uh, investment that are pushing people out into the streets. Let's put our pension money into doing something that is good for the future, for our children, not for for these guys who is, or just want to create. You know, they're they're emptying everything. They're 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 not building anything. They're not creating any wealth. When somehow, you know, if you want to come to the city, you had a job in the city, you could live in the city. We have arrived at a moment when there is a gaping hole in our system. Most of our major international systems or, don't take the individual so seriously. Lalani, uh, Frederick, welcome back to Renegade Inc. Uh, in the uh, first half, um, the theme, if you like, uh, was people who extract wealth uh, and people who create wealth. People who create wealth in the real economy, people who extract it through financialization. Rana Faruha wrote a book called Makers vs. Takers, uh, and in it charts um, the, uh, the Blackstone effect, if you like. Uh, they were taken to court after the 2008 crisis, and they struck a deal on the steps of that court without hearing a case to buy a great swathe of housing stock uh, in the US. Now, that has become the taker's model, hasn't it? Uh, go out, buy these uh, assets, get the price up, take the rent out, uh, and the makers, the people who work in the real economy, the people who rely on wages, uh, don't get a look in. Uh, how much uh, of that divide uh, is coming, whether we like it or not, to a city near us? Oh, it's already come to every city around the world. I mean, the domination of um, 
private equity, pension funds, massive asset management firms buying up properties to take, uh, as to use the language you threw out there, Ross, uh, is, is, is happening all the time, complete, um, in not just the major cities of the world, in the secondary cities as well. I mean, I live in Canada. Yes, it's happening in Toronto and Vancouver, and then it's happening in a place called Hamilton. Ever heard of Hamilton? No. I mean, it's happening in a place called Kitchener-Waterloo, in Windsor, Ontario. I mean, so it, this is everywhere, and it is also happening in the global south. Um, so it's all, it, it's, it, this is the main. We need to start curbing the main. What you've done is highlight uh, an invisible process though, Frederick. Uh, what we have now is financial capitalism. We've offshored all our uh, making uh, to far-flung places around the place. So we import products, uh, we have a service-based economy, and financial capitalism is uh, eating itself. Originally, the Big Bang in the UK, we thought that the city would bring all these riches, forgetting that actually a uh, financial centre is a cost centre, not a value add. You've highlighted that in this film, haven't you? Yeah, we, tr we try to understand that sector. And it's, I mean, it's, it's not easy because it's a sector full of, of language. They, they talk a lot and they, it's very fluffy explanations. <laughs> it's, very, it's very much about getting down to, the, to the, what they do. They actually, they're just taking wealth away. And, and, you know, when they enter, when Blackstone enters somewhere, and now we, we name drop Blackstone a lot, it could be many others, of course, but they enter, but it's a very court, you know, Blackstone say, we buy, we fix, we sell. And it's when we, when we follow them, it's, it's very often, you know, Blackstone bought 42,000 coal, former coal miners apartments in the Czech Republic out, you know, and then four years later, boom, sell it on to someone else. And that's how they how they roll, and and they have also now have there's a lot of copycats of course who do the same. So I can see around here in Sweden, small they go in and they try to buy, buy public houses around in smaller cities, and they're creating packages so they, they can sell on to to bigger to bigger cats. You know, so it's it is uh, it's very destructive. It's not you know it, it, we we measure GDP on you know. If my neighbor's house is being 100% more expensive in 10 years, is so then the GDP because of that building is better. You know, it's it's totally stupid way of measuring economy. The value, this this inflated value that they create with their with their their, their business model, and they do it on 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 our shoulders also. Lalani, do they use impenetrable language and to camouflage what they're actually doing? Well, absolutely. That's part of the game. Because it's all, it's pretty simple stuff, this, isn't it? Buy an asset, uh, or buy a lot of assets, make sure that the price goes up and everything, flip them onto the market, and like locusts, move on to the next tree. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, and, and I mean, they want to create their own world. It's a, it's a lot of guys talking to a lot of guys, certainly as a human rights lawyer and as a filmmaker, uh, we had to penetrate uh, that language and break it down. And as you say, it's actually not that complicated. Um, but I don't want to just talk about private equity because governments are thick as thieves with these actors. And it's really important to know that governments are playing this game too. The language game, the setting of interest rates so low, the making these, um, these financial products as accessible, as tax-free as they are. So um, it's, it, it, it's a whole, that's what I mean about, there is a dismantling that has to happen. And there's a way in which these movements may seem really far apart, like Black Lives Matter and what we're talking about today. But there is a way in which they collide because there's a forcing of different language, different actors, different realities coming to the forefront. Even the Me Too movement, which I'm like really not part of and don't really pay too much attention to myself, even that, it's about telling different narratives and putting different narratives out there. And I think that's where... Um, we need to go and we're starting to go with respect to this whole financialization of housing stuff. I think people are starting to say, hey, wait, the, the narrative that's being told by my government and by these actors is not my narrative. Before we come to solutions, very briefly, Frederick, I don't know uh, how much thought you've given to the economics discipline. I know you have Professor Joseph Stiglitz in the film. Uh, how much uh, does the discipline of uh, economics have to uh, 
answer for, if you like, um, when you realise that uh, they don't make a, a distinction between land, labour and capital. They don't see land at all. They only see labour and capital conflating land with capital as if uh, land A doesn't exist and B, housing isn't the problem, nor is private debt. Yeah, you know, there is a phenomenon we talk about very much in, you know, in the, in the so-called third world, that you call it land grabbing. Uh, you know, you, 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 you kick people out and you start to plant palm oil, you cut the forest and you, you bring in cows or whatever. You know, that's kind of the very aggressive form of taking over land. What's going on in the center of London? You started off with gentrification. It's actually land grabbing that is going on. They are, this, the sa it's the same kind of money, the same kind of mechanisms moving in and grabbing land because that's, they, they have, you know, there is this cloud of money out there and they are playing around with that cloud, but they still need some kind of assets to, to link the money to. And then they need, they need these empty houses in London. They need the, the big fields of Af in Africa or whatever, you know, it's like, but it's not about producing food. It's not about housing people. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's something totally different. And I think it, Professor Stieglitz in the film is, is, is very clear that it's, this is not productive money anymore. My own work was concerned about asymmetries of information, the fact that some people know things that other people don't, and that gives some people the ability to take advantage of others. Um, you can make more money not by making a better product and lowering cost of production, which is the standard economic analysis, but by fishing for fools, looking for people you can take advantage of. They're not creating wealth, they're actually just taking wealth. If you're somebody like the head of Blackstone, you know, I've heard him talk about the big advantages of no regulation, of deregulation. Of course he wants to be able to exploit the people who are living in his properties. The logical conclusion, I think, is if we keep allowing financialization to go on and on and on in this way, we're going to have impoverished cities. We're going to have cities where the people who work to make cities vibrant and function won't live there and can't live there because they can't afford it. We already are seeing this San Francisco. Try to find an Uber driver in San Francisco who lives in, lives in San Francisco or a barista who lives in San Francisco. Impossible. The logical conclusion is a lot of human misery, a lot of homelessness, unsustainable cities. That to me is what, the, that's the impact of all of this. And that's why it's so important that we solve it. Um, I don't really care about Blackstone and the money they make and whatever, their, their world domination. Yeah. What I care about is the impact they're having. Uh, this, uh, Frederick, is a massive global Ponzi scheme. Let me put that to you. Uh, it's uh, built on greater fool theory. Uh, you flip this to somebody who's got uh, access to credit and is arguably a greater fool than you because they're paying more for it. Uh, and uh, the underlying bit, back to Blackstone, uh, is um, wealth extraction. It's taking out the rents. What uh, is the, uh, would you say, uh, solution? What's the start of the solution to this? Well, first of all, it's, I don't think their business model is about taking out the rents. Their business model is about pushing up the values of the assets, they, the undervaluated assets they buy. And putting up the rent is a part of that game. Uh, so the value of that investment goes up and of that, those companies so they can sell them on. So it's, it's all about pushing up the values of their stocks. It's like a financial game. Uh, so, I mean, I think what the, the government in Denmark has done and the government in Berlin and also in Catalonia, Spain, uh, is, you know, you, you, you need to find ways to slow, to make it less rentable to, to move in and move out. Basically, so it, you should kind of give priority to the classical pension funds who are sitting on properties for 15, 20 years. That's more interesting because they don't have to, to make money in that speed. But Blackstone and these kind of vultures, they always want to move very quick. So I think legislators need to look into that and make it more difficult and of course, what movements should do and politicians and journalists is to highlight this 
and also show the inspirational stories coming out then from Berlin and Barcelona and other places where people are in Denmark, where people are fighting back. And I, and I think this is happening. And of course, it happens also in the United Kingdom. There's a lot of good people taking, taking the fight right now. Mm. Lalani, what about taxing the land that these buildings sit on? Therefore, we can take uh, taxes off wages, uh, capture the land value, capture the cre- community created value, and um, it's allay some of that human misery that you were talking about. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure taxation can and is already, in fact, being used in some jurisdictions uh, for greater good uh, and to ensure um, that there's affordable housing, et cetera. But that would just be one measure. There, I mean, I think that... A, that Governments need to take that big step back and say, okay, what is it that we, that are our social goods in this world? And what are our human rights obligations? We know what the social goods are still. Most people still believe health or health care is a social good. Most people still believe education is a social good. Most people still believe water and sanitation services are a social good. And we need to start pivoting back to understanding that housing is also a social good. And from there, we can start setting policies and creating laws that ensure everyone has access to that social good so that they can live a dignified life and go to work and send their children to school and do all the things that society expects of us as human beings. So um, it's, uh, I think to borrow some language that Frederick has used with me before that I really like, Uh, and that others are talking about now, it's about re-engaging the social contract. What happened to it? (laughs) It's gone. I mean, so I I, I like that. I I mean, I'm a macro person in the way that I think, and um, I I have more vision than I, I'm not a technocrat and sort of this, that, and the other. Tax policies are being used, yes, but I like to see that big step back. And that's what the government of Denmark and Barcelona and Berlin have been saying. They're reasserting through people and people's claims that housing is a human right and a social good and not a commodity to be played with on stock markets and by financial actors. You uh, have done uh, a remarkable thing. Push is a fantastic film. Thank you both for it. Uh, Lalani Faha and uh, Frederick Gettin, thank you both for your time. Thanks, Ross.